Bill, you've spent a good deal of your professional career looking at intelligent design, trying to infer design from the, the physical world. Uh, an extrapolation from that that people would use is that there is a God who is a creator. So as a Christian who believes independently of your intelligent design work, uh, how, how do you reflect on, on God as a creator? Uh, w what, is that, what does that mean when you dig below the surface? Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, you know, so much of theology, uh, contemporary theology, is worried about anthropomorphism, that somehow if we attribute some feature that we have as humans to God, that somehow that's unworthy of God. And uh, when I hear that, I think of C.S. Lewis's treatment in Miracles, where he says, well, then what happens when you use other metaphors? You think of God as some force, you know, or some field. Or, you know, and then he described one woman who, when she reflected on it, basically her image of God was that of some sort of pudding or something. You know, this, you know everywhere diffused field. So uh, I'm not so worried about anthropomorphism. It seems that if we are, in fact, the crown of creation, if we are made in the image of God, then in a sense, by looking inside ourselves, our own creativity, we can get some insight into God's creative activity. And it, uh, when you think of that, then, it, it, it's, you know, what you find is that, in a sense, creative activity, in acting by intelligence, becomes the fundamental mode of causation because God, by a spoken word, brings the world into being. You know, and then that world takes on a determinate character where physical laws seem to operate. So, in a sense, those are derivative. You know, and I think uh, the... Uh, materialistic evolutionist turns that on its head. It's that material processes are fundamental, and then intelligence is this evolutionary byproduct. So the religion that you would believe in and believe in the Bible would, in essence, give you permission, or maybe even encourage you to be anthropomorphic, which most people, I agree, try to avoid, and that's the, that's the yeah. worst curse you can <laughs> say to somebody, well, but you're not... I, I'm not, not, you're I'm not, not so worried as, about yeah. it, I mean, but I think, you know, you, you, you have to be careful and you want to dis always discipline your inquiry, but uh, insofar as you can get insights about the world, where do we look? We can look outside, we can look within, you know, and uh, it seems that we can get some legitimate insights into divine creativity just by the nature of our own right. creativity. So, 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 so to do some of that, as you, as you would try to look inside and in nature of creativity and you, and you yeah. see that that's probably yeah. the most single characteristic we know of God, if, if there is a God, and that, uh, of what God created, and we look inside and we see creativity. What, what can we then infer to how that might work with well, God? I mean, I think we, we, we ourselves are designers, engineers. We engineer things. We look inside the cell. We find that the cell has all sorts of signal transduction circuitry, information processing, storage, retrieval, control, you know, uh, communication <laughs> systems, all of this. And we say, well, uh, if there's a designer behind it, then that designer is a consummate nano-engineer. Okay, but then you can go beyond that. I mean, you look at some of the the beauty of nature. I mean, there's a whole aesthetic dimension to the creation, and uh, so I think you can you can attribute that to the creator. That uh, as a creator appreciates beauty, uh, you know, the, and then the creativity that we see expressed through us. I mean, it's uh, you know, I mean. The classical Greeks, I mean, they would invoke the muse. I mean, there, there were, you know, how does a Mozart, how does a Bach do it? I, there's there's a, uh, an apologetics treatise by a fellow named Peter Kreeft who teaches at uh, Boston College. And he lists about 30, 40 proofs of God's existence. And one of his proofs is Bach. And that's it. <laughs> you know? That's it. Well, I mean, you know, uh, how do you account for a genius of, of that sort? You know, it's, uh, so it, it seems to me that, um, you know, uh, human creativity at its best is really quite marvelous and if we think then that pales in comparison with, with that of the, the creator who makes it possible uh, for people like Bach and Mozart and Michelangelo and Dante to exist, you know, then you think, wow, I mean, this, is, this has to be quite a god. So let me think inside of me and when I struggle to be creative, one of the things that I get is, uh, is tired. Uh, when I've done a lot of work, and sometimes it's good creativity, sometimes not so good, but I get, get tired after a time, and now I know 
in the uh, in Genesis, it talks about God working for six days, and then, then he rested on the seventh day. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it, 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 is that a parallel that you well, would Well, I'm, I'm, I think it's a parallel that I explored before. I'm not sure I'd, I'd want to go quite that far there, because you know, <laughs> the scriptures also say that uh, God neither slumbers nor sleeps, right. and you know, it doesn't seem that God does get tired, but there's a sense in which, um, yeah, this creativity was hard work, you know, but, um, you know, but... Uh, also, I mean, there, there's a sense in which a lot of creativity, you know, there, there's a classical distinction between discursive reason and, if you will, intuition, ratio and uh, intellectus. And uh, it seems that, you know, we do have to work hard at some things, you know, and, and work, you know, work out the details. And then sometimes you read about mathematicians like Henri Poincaré, or, uh, who was the, the fellow who invented, uh, saw the structure of benzene. He had this dream and you know, <laughs> yeah, the, the, a, yeah. the, saw the snake eating itself and then got the structure of benzene. Head eating so, its tail. And yeah, brown, yeah, and so you, yeah. you suddenly see the, you know, we, we see these things. And so in a sense, uh, you know, I mean, human creativity, how we get it, I mean, I'm not sure that there are, you know, that, that there are that parallels there with how God does it. It seems that God, you know, in a sense, nothing, at some level, nothing is difficult for him. But, you know, I'm speculating. You know, sure, and, and, uh, and, but, but I, th I think speculation is important yeah. because, if, 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 because this is not something that's trivial. It's, yeah. it's obviously a critical part of your life. I, I you know... Uh, it, it may or may not be part of my life. I would, I would like it to be. Yeah. Uh, it has in the past at some points and some points not. Uh, so I'm struggling with it, as, as many people do. Uh, and, and in order to really understand it, you, you have to explore all, all yeah. these aspects to really feel it, feel it very, very deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we probe deeper into the nature of creativity, certainly the Judeo-Christian God, the world, the universe, is, is independent of that. God, whereas in some Eastern religions or in pantheism or in Spinoza, God is, 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 is sort of uh, uh, coterminous co or, or, or co-spatial with, with the world. I mean, there are different views. So your view would have God, be, the world being independent of God. Well, independent is too strong. I mean, the traditional doctrines have been transcendence and immanence, and, you know, it uh, tends to be both. It's both and. I mean, God, in a, there is this separate or this distance in the sense that God is is not identical with the world, and yet God is imminent in it and you know, intimately connected with it. And, and, and yeah. so in, in the creative process, how, does that, how might that imminence work? Because well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, how is it that the, the information, the structures, the patterns that are required for life and for the, the, the world to come about, it seems that, uh, you know, God has to be working in the world to, to bring these things about. And uh, I, I do see a place for, for evolution, you know, where, where God is bringing things about by an evolutionary process, cosmological evolution, some biological evolution. Uh, and so it is, I would, I would see it as an imminent God working in nature, but bringing about purposes, and then, from the intelligent design perspective, doing it in a way that's discernible, that's scientifically detectable. You know, so that's so, so <clears throat> you, you would have God building into the process of creation signs, if you will, that intelligence, our intelligence, can discern, right. and perhaps discern at this time in human history with the kinds of skills and, and reasoning capabilities that we, we have now. Yeah, I think with, with, with the tools of science, I think especially, uh, I mean, we, we have the, the, the idea of detecting design is, is actually widespread. I mean, there are lots of special sciences that do this already. The question is, can we do it in the natural sciences? Traditionally, the nat when I say traditionally, since the rise of modern science, uh, they, the natural sciences have resisted the idea that you could find teleology or purpose actually displayed through the, through the science. It's rather you would... Uh, teleology purpose, that would be some sort of theological or metaphysical construct over and above the actual yeah. science. But uh, I think we're, we're finding signs of intelligence in ways that we can access it scientifically. You know, and that, uh, I think it's, it's an exciting development, if we're right. <laughs> if we're wrong, well, then we wasted our time. You know. But you had fun in the process. We had fun. We had fun. <laughs>